Amen. Amen. All right. So, this morning, uh, we are tag-teaming on the subject of the call of God. The call of God. Now, for some of you, you might be thinking, okay, Matthew, what on earth? Uh, the call of God, that only has to do with preachers, right? So, I, I can check out of this sermon. Or, or you can say, well, I'll, I'll, that, that just applies to missionaries. So, I can check out. Or, uh, you know, fill in the blank, you know, uh, college, Christian college professors, and you know, we can go on and on with a, a list of uh, people that we think the call of God applies to. But, you know, God has a call for every single one of us. Mm -hmm. Now, Micah and I both, I don't know how this happened, but both of us, God called us to preach. Uh, and I'll tell you what, it wasn't because I wanted a whole long line of preachers in my uh, household. <laughs> Uh, in fact, uh, I was the first one in my family to uh, be called into the ministry, and that was it was that was just different. Uh, and then, especially when things kind of took a little different direction in our family, I remember having a conversation in 2014 with uh, Austin, Micah, and Madison. Now they were at that time about. Ten, eight, and six. Knee high to a June bug. Yeah. Exactly. You got your mic on? <laughs> Might not. I turned it on. Okay. <laughs> so uh, he, you're going to hear comments from the peanut gallery from time to time. But uh, I say that lovingly, of course. But I had a conversation with them. I, I thought, you know, I was, I was getting ready to be a divorced man, and I thought, you know, I, I'm as good as done. That's what a lot of people were going to tell me. So I, I told the kids, I said, whatever you do, don't go into ministry. Because you, you, you might end up like me, and, and people are going to toss you off to the side. So just do anything but that. And then I said, I'm going to ministry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, boy, are you, we, we need to get you checked out. But seriously, I said, don't do it. I said, uh, scrub floors. Uh, scrub boogers off school desks, do anything <laughs> but go into ministry. I, I was serious. Uh, a little parenting tip. D don't try to give your kids life lessons from deep, uh, sorrowful parts of your life. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that in retrospect, but, you know, you live and learn, right? <laughs> and, and thank God for His grace. But this was, this was something that... I didn't see coming for a long time because his plan was to be a politician. Dangerous he was, field. <laughs> yeah, dangerous field, exactly. And he was going to go in, uh, he, he, was, he said he's going to be the next president of the United States at some point. And I thought, God bless you. I, and I, I was praying inwardly, God, redirect him. <laughs> I mean, he had the passion, don't get me wrong. But I, I'm like, Lord, oh, I don't want to. Uh, you know, if, if he did make it to president, it would have been not cool to go into the White House and all that yeah. stuff. But now I'm like, nah, I, I'll, <laughs> I, I'll escape that for, <laughs> for selfish reasons. But I'd, I wanted to make sure that God called him. Because I went into Bible college, and here was a story with a lot of Bible college students. Well, a friend of mine, he came in, and you know why he went to that Bible college? His dad went to that Bible college. And his mom went to that Bible college. And he said, my dad went and uh, he wanted to be a missionary. And he ended up serving on the field for decades. But he said, my mom, she came for one reason, and that was to get her MRS degree. If y'all don't know what the MRS degree is, that, that, you know, get a ring on it. So, she, they, so they got married. And uh, that was, yeah, that, that was how things rolled there. And then... <laughs> He, his brother, and his sister all went to the same college. So, having grown up in a situation that wasn't, you know, wasn't used to that, I thought it was kind of cringy for all these uh, generations of people to all come to the same Bible college. And I thought, that's just strange. But, anyway. Uh, so, I wanted to make sure God called him. And we'll hear his story about a call in, in a minute. But I want to say an introductory statement. We all have a calling, first to salvation. God, God, God saves us and He draws us to Himself. We hear the gospel, He draws us to Himself. He calls us to salvation. 
But we've seen, as we've been in the book of Acts, that that call very quickly involves a call to service. You find yourself, uh, God saying, okay, not only do I want you to be saved, and a lot of people think, oh, I'm saved, I've got fire insurance, that's wonderful. But it calls us to service as well. Every single one of us has a gift. Uh, God gives us a gift, and he calls us uh, to use that gift and, and to develop that gift. In fact, he told Timothy, uh, stir up the gift that is in you. He wants us to develop that. And from the onset, there are some of you, every one of you is a gifted individual. And some of you right now, you've been sitting on that gift for a long time like an egg waiting to be hatched. And that, that, that egg hatched a long time ago. You've been trying to hide it. So I'm going to go ahead and say right now, if that's you, uh, today is the day to change that. So with that said, uh, Micah, would you go into your uh, story about your calling and give us a few biblical thoughts? Sounds good. Um, in 2019, it was uh, kind of an interesting year of my life. I was in my sophomore year of high school, and uh, strange enough, I had that plan of being a uh, politician. And uh, I tell you, I got into so many political arguments. I was too argumentative. I said, I said, <laughs> I said, thank God, you know, you're turning me away from politics. I'm too argumentative before. I was in a public speaking class, and that was probably the biggest mistake of my life. I probably made a lot of kids mad. But, um, <laughs> but uh, around about my sophomore year of high school, I began to feel like maybe this isn't the direction that I should be going. And, you know, at first I was like, nah, this is just a weird thought. My dad's a preacher. I probably shouldn't end up like him. He ain't that great. I'm kidding. He's wonderful. Um, uh, I, I'd always kind of thought, you know, I don't think I'll end up being a preacher. I don't think I'm prepared enough. I don't think I'm equipped enough. I'm not compassionate enough. Um, I'm just not God's perfect picture for what a pastor should be. Um, and the end of my sophomore year, the church I was attending was this church in... Um, Charleston, South Carolina, which is where I lived for six and a half years of my, uh, my life. I was there between uh, 11 years old and uh, about 17. Um, and they had, uh, had an internship program for the summer um, that the senior pastor and the administrative pastor were uh, administrating. And, uh, and I had been selected to be one of the two interns. I was the guy that was going to help out with music. And the other guy did like tech stuff, like he was computers and, and audio video and all that sort of stuff. And, and I'm a musical guy, so I was okay with music. I don't know my left from my right on computers. Most kids can look at an iPad at two years old and figure it out. I tell you, August over there, if he's in here, if he's in here that kid, he, he knows how to use this thing better than I do. It blows my mind. <laughs> but um, I, so I said, okay, music. And so I just kind of did it as, you know, something to kind of launch myself into the workforce and to help out with the ministries of the church and and it had not phased me that those next two months were going to be something that would really speak to me. Um, Palm Sunday prior to that in um, I can't remember if it was April or May of 2019 um, we had a guest speaker and the evangelist named Jamie Ragel. I don't know if any of you ever heard him speak. He's a uh, comedic evangelist. He's spoken at many churches uh, First Baptist Church of Jacksonville many years ago when he was with that crowd, and now he speaks at pretty much any church that'll have him. Um, I'd just met him that morning, and I'd picked him up from his hotel in Charleston, and he introduced himself, and he made some terrible dry joke. And you know, every pastor is good at making dry jokes. I spend enough time with him, you'll find find that out. And uh, well, turn his mic off. <laughs> Well, he told that dry joke, and I got to know him a little bit between the 10 minutes that was between his hotel and the church. And uh, we get up there, he gets to preach, and um, I had been kind of feeling God pulling me a different direction. Like I told you, I felt like this wasn't what God wanted me to do, the political field. So I said, I kneeled by my bed, I said, Lord, you got to give me a sign. I, I said, I am a winter's, I don't, I, I got to get told clear. You can't give me hints, I got to be, you got to shoot it straight with me. So I said, God, shoot it straight. We get up there in church, and Jamie gets up on the stage, and 
And in front of about three or four hundred people that Sunday, he says, Micah, because he talks like that. He sounds like a hippie, but he's really not. Um, he's got that spiked up hair thing going on, but he's cool. He says, Micah, I don't mean to pick you out or pull you out of a crowd or anything. And my hair turned as red as my, excuse me, my face turned as red as my hair. I was as red as my hair. Um, and he says, I don't know what's kind of pulling me to say this, but God's got something really big for your life. And I'm like, what? You, are you like miking me or something? You got a, a recording under my dresser or something? You're listening to me? Uh, but no, I, I went home that day and I was like, this is the strangest thing. And so I spent the next few months kind of brushing it off, not really paying much attention to it. Um, and then that internship came, and over the next couple of months, um, it became so clear to me that that was what God wanted me to do. He said, ministry. Prayer after prayer, ministry, ministry. Didn't know what it was going to be. Uh, my dad here was in uh, music ministry for 15, 20 years, something like that. Too long. Um, now he was in he was in music ministry for a long time, and uh, my stepfather is also in ministry. He's uh, in music, and so I don't know if music was the particular facet that I needed to go in, but I wasn't entirely sure. So I just kept praying about it, and uh, spoke with some pastors, spoke with some people, kept some time in the Word of God. I read a whole bunch of books, uh, wasted a lot of my time with a lot of these books. Some of them were some Calvinists, and that's not the greatest direction to have to go and to rely on some resources, but. Uh, you take the meat off the bone. Um, but I spent a lot of time praying, and I, and I really, really felt, okay, this is what God wants me to do. God, I surrender myself to you. I surrender my life to you. I don't think I'm prepared for this. I don't think I'm equipped for this. But God, you speak to me. You draw me. You tell me what to do, and I will uh, become who you want me to be. Um, so I, uh, I said that. But then there's this particular, uh, you know, Satan has really wonderful ways of distracting people. Anybody that says Satan's stupid, they're wrong. Satan is brilliant. He is absolutely brilliant. He is a master at deceit, at, at distractions, and young people. He, he sends women after you. I'm telling you, that's always what it is. <laughs> Nothing wrong with y'all ladies. But it's usually a woman. And there was this particular woman that was going to that, I say woman, young lady, I should say, that was going to that church, and I knew something was wrong with her. But I liked her anyway. And she liked me. That was not a good thing. Hormones at a young age is not a good thing to let control your brain. Um, <laughs> but I, I got with her, and we, we dated for a few months, and that's the most miserable time of my life. Because she was nice, and she was a good person. She was not saved, though she claimed to be. I did not know I was digging myself into a hole by dating her. But she was a nice person. She was sweet. She was compassionate. She was considerate. Really just overall a good person. But good doesn't get you to heaven. Good gets you to hell unless you're saved. Um, but she was such a distraction to me, and it kept me from focusing on what God wanted me to do. I almost had tunnel vision because of what she was, the direction she was sending me in. Here was me looking at her. God's over here. God's over there. I can't see him because I'm so distracted by this person. And it took me a long time to finally realize and get the courage enough to have to hurt her feelings to, and to resist mine to break up with her. I knew that that was a distraction really from the beginning, but I never listened to the Lord. I wasn't mindful of what he was trying to tell me. Um, again, a good lesson to learn is when God's really preparing you and he's trying to get you ready, that's when Satan strikes. So if, if you have a feeling or a hunch God's drawing you to make a decision, listen to that. Don't let some person, some pet, if it's a dog for some strange reason, Satan will use anything. So if it's a cute little uh, corgi, Austin's obsessed with those dogs. If it's a cute little corgi that's getting in your way and distracting you from God, I mean, heck, if God's saying, 
get in your church, get involved in your church, serve in your church, and you get a dog that keeps you at the house all the time, that could be a dog used as a distraction. But when God is really getting you ready, you know and be mindful of the distractions that are coming. But a couple of lessons I learned from, from monitoring how my dad leads over the years he's been in ministry, monitoring my grandfather, who's also a pastor, uh, not his dad, but my mother's uh, dad. Uh, Papa Winters ain't much of a pastor. I love him to death, but he, he's, a, he's kind of a cantankerous uh, man. <laughs> but uh, if he's watching this, if he's watching. if he's watching this, I'm sorry, Papa. I love you, but. Uh, <laughs> but uh, my other grandfather, you know, I monitored all these gentlemen, and I learned something, a lot of things about the calling from God, and even through that internship, because I did a lot more than just music. I helped out with some of the needs of the church, and, and I played with uh, the piano at a couple funerals, the first funeral I ever played at. Uh, some of y'all, y'all think, man, he's just so great at the piano. Three years ago, I was not. I was terrible. You probably kicked me out after fir playing the first chord. Uh, if you'd heard me three years ago, that first funeral, I, I think that our pastor regretted asking me to play. But uh, after that, I, I got a little bit better. But I learned a few things through that internship and through talking with a lot of pastors and getting to know a lot of pastors through the um, Charleston Baptist Association. Because though I know we're not a denominational here, I am a Southern Baptist. As crazy and ridiculous as the direction of the Southern Baptist Convention is going, I might not be much longer. But for now, I am. Um, through, anyway, from learning through these gentlemen, I learned a few things. Here's three particular points I want to kind of just briefly go over, three things I learned. Number one, a calling consists of an unbelievable test. I'm going to take a look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter uh, 6 this morning. My Bible doesn't want to go there. I'm trying to close on me. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Um, initially, I had planned on reading from verse 2, but... This morning, I felt God was saying, just do verses 11 and 12. So verses 11 and 12 say this. If you have your Bible with you, go ahead and follow along. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 says this. But flee from these things, ye man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and, made the good con and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Something I really learned is, you know, I am not the kind of person to have gentleness, particularly as uh, listed in verse 11. It, it's, when I say an unbelievable test, it really tests your nature. As humans with a nature of sin, it's challenging to reflect Christ's likeness. I am a human being. I am not perfect. Nobody in here is perfect. It is really challenging to try to, when God's calling you and you just do not feel prepared to reflect Christ's likeness. Because as pastors, and, and even uh, as Christians, you should reflect Christ's likeness. But with pastors, you're not just reflecting it for your own good or for your family's good, but you're reflecting it for your church. Because as a pastor, you're not just you know, you're a father or a friend or a mentor, but you are an example. You have to reflect Christ's likeness. So it's really challenging to try to, and with the pressure of what goes on as a pastor, it's, it's challenging to try to reflect that Christ likeness. And it tests your uh, patience, tests your human nature. And I'm going to kind of elaborate more along that patience line. There's two lessons you can learn from that. Uh, it tests your nature, and it does test your patience sometimes. Sometimes when God may be calling you into service, and service is not just preaching, it's not just playing an instrument, it's not just music. Service can be changing a diaper in a nursery room. Not a lot of fun, but if God's calling you that and God's getting you ready for it, He will help you change diapers. Um, if God is... <laughs> lost in your laugh cracks me up. <laughs> I can't even with that kid. Uh, <laughs> uh, but... If God's calling you to deal with kids, I tell you, I love my three little siblings. August, Bella, and Andrew, they're just, uh, yeah, August, Bella, I keep mixing their names up sometimes. Bella, August, Andrew. Um, they test my patience sometimes. I'm, I'm so used to a quiet house. Now, I work in a men's warehouse where I live, which is why I'm not here very often. They make you work weekends except for Sunday for me. 
thank thank the Lord. Um, but and I deal with a lot. It's usually quiet in there. There's not a whole lot going on. It's loud. I work in a quiet place. I uh, I live in a quiet place. Austin, he may be loud on that bass, but overall, he's not very loud. Uh, Madison, she might talk your ear off a little bit and tell you, "Oh my gosh, my friend's drama," but. Um, <laughs> But she, uh, she's not really loud. So, you know, kids can test your patience sometimes with how loud they are. They do me, particularly. But um, I learned if God's going to call you to get involved in children's ministry, he's going to teach you how to deal with those children. He's, he's going to help you not want to strangle them by the neck. Because I've never had kids. I'm too young to have kids. I won't be having them anytime soon. But anybody here that's had kids can testify. You want to look, look at your kid and think, Oh, Jesus, give me that strength. But, um, you know, sometimes ministry can test your patience, whether it's in um, children's ministry, it's in youth ministry, it's um, playing an instrument. Austin, sometimes he just gets mad at himself when he messes up on a note. He'll go, oh, my gosh, I can't play this right. So sometimes ministry tests your patience. So you have to, you know, it will test your uh, nature as, as humanity, uh, to try to reflect Christ's likeness, it becomes a test sometimes, and then it will test patience. Uh, secondly, a calling consists of an unfathomable task. Uh, flip over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, um, verse 3. Just a short, brief little verse. I'm, probably, I'm going to give you all a couple seconds to flip pages. Uh, something my girlfriend likes to talk to me sometimes, is she'll go to hear preachers sometimes, and, and uh, they'll, call, they'll flip the page, or they'll call out the... Bible passage they want you to open to, and they won't give you any time to flip there. So you'll be flipping, and they'll do the Lord where the Lord says this, and I'll just jump right through it. So I'm I'm giving y'all some time. But uh, 2 Timothy chapter two verse three, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Um, first and Second Timothy are uh, really kind of textbooks for for Timothy written by Paul um, to help him with ministry. Timothy was a student of the ministry. He was a student of Paul. Uh, he was under his guidance. Um, it's also a textbook for, for people in, in ministry now. But in the context of the scripture, this is a lesson he's trying to teach Timothy. He's saying, I like what verse says. First one says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in grace. Be strong in grace. That's a challenge sometimes. It's a task when you're not a gracious person, to have to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Um, but then I also like um, what it says. I want to kind of point out verse 3. After he says, suffer hardship with me, he goes on to call, uh, he's saying, he kind of parallels and uses an analogy, as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Something that always kind of humors me sometimes is people will say things like, oh, I can't believe I'm going through persecution. I can't believe I'm going through this. You ever read the Bible? I mean, I don't mean to sound super blunt, but the Bible is a story of people going through persecution. Reality as a Christian, in America, we're spoiled by how we have the ability to come together on Sunday and to worship and to sing music, and to play the instruments, and to, to just be here. That's something we take for granted as Christians. You look particularly at Ukraine. We've, we've all seen what's happening in Ukraine right now with uh, Russia and, and a lot in the Middle East. They risk their lives, their lives, excuse me, coming to church every day. And they probably view themselves as foot soldiers of Christ. How often do we view ourselves as foot soldiers of Jesus Christ? Soldiers of the... I like that. What's that Southern Gospel song? Lift high the banner, I think. Ye soldiers of the cross. Da, 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 must not suffer loss. I like that, that lyric. Soldiers of the cross. Um, we're going to have to fight. Particularly, I think, in the next... Well, we see. we got a couple more years of... Uh, hope nobody's a Democrat in here this morning, but... We got a couple more years of Biden. We got a fight there, especially when you're going to the gas pump. I never thought I'd have to take a loan out to get gasoline, but but uh, we got a fight, you know. And in the next decade, in the next twenty years, I think of my life, I'm going to see 
Christianity where it's going to be hard to come to church. Everything's going, every being is going to fight against church. People are going to try to cancel church. They're going to cancel Christianity. They're going to cancel gatherings. Churches won't be able to grow because some numbskulls are going to make a law where we can't gather together for some reason. I, I just feel like that's going to happen in the next 20 years or so. So we have to view ourselves as foot soldiers of the cross. Now, I said a moment ago, some people think it's kind of crazy that we have to suffer as Christians. But I like 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. If you want to flip there, you can, but I'm going to do that thing that my, I told you my girlfriend was talking about. I'm just going to read it real quick. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fire ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. I'm going to cut those commas out. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fire, fiery ordeal among you as though some strange thing were happening. It's not strange. Look at the Bible. Like I said, just read it. It's a story of suffering. You look at any of the people. I mean, Abraham building a... Um, not building, that was Noah. Abraham traveling um, through wilderness. Uh, what did what, what he... He went to Ur. He was in Ur. Went. I have, it's been a long time since I've read Genesis. Um, but, you know, he had to travel and he had the issues with, um, with his wife uh, with pregnancy. That was probably a struggle. If any of you here have had trouble with pregnancies, it was probably a struggle when God says have a child and he thinks, well, she's 90 years old, she can't have children. Suffering. Uh, Noah building an ark. If you ever spent any time outside, it's hot. It's a suffering thing to, do, to build an ark for. How long did it take him to build that? Long time. Long time. Um, Jesus, that's a perfect picture of suffering. Perfect man, spotless, blameless, suffered on a cross. Uh, Joseph, he had to suffer as a slave and in prison um, and then became the right hand of Pharaoh. I mean, we're having to, we're going to have tasks sometimes that are unfathomable, if you think about it. And, uh, you know, God's going to give us that strength to, uh, to deal with those things. If God calls you, God equips you. Because, like I said, I felt unworthy as an ungracious person. God has given me more grace in the past three years. I'm still a cantankerous person sometimes, but God has given me more grace in how I deal with people. And Men's Warehouse has taught me a lesson. Some customers, whew, that blows my mind. I, I, it's in North Carolina, so some of y'all South Carolina people say, it's them North Carolinians, they're crazy up there. I'm just going to be quiet. I kind mm -hmm. of agree. But I didn't say that. Anybody in North Carolina that's watching, I love y'all. Especially y'all church people. Don't kick me out. Um, but, you know, God's going to equip you for those tasks. The third thing I learned is a calling consists of an unworthy thought. And this kind of links back to what I just said. There are two particular stories I want to point out um, from, excuse me, from a couple passages in the Bible that really kind of link in with the unworthy thought. The first thing I want to go to is uh, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16. If you want to turn there real quick. Uh, we all know the story of, uh, of David. David, the man after God's own heart. We've all heard the story of David and Goliath and uh, David and Bathsheba. We all know, you know, David pretty well. Well, some of us know the story of when uh, S uh, excuse me, Samuel, God says Samuel, Saul, Saul had dis been disobedient to God. And uh, Samuel, he says, God says to Samuel, I need a new king. There had only been one king in Israel's history. That was Saul. And uh, God impressed upon Samuel to go find a new king. And so he was directed to the house of Jesse. And if you look in the story, and I'm not going to read all the verses, but if you look in the story of, of when he was looking for a king, uh, Jesse presents all of his sons to Samuel. And every last one of them, he says, the Lord has not chosen this one. And he's looked at all these. And then Samuel said to Jesse in verse 11, I want to uh, read that. And Samuel said to Jesse, are these all the children? He had been hiding something. And he said, There remains yet the youngest, and behold, he is tending the sheep. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. 
So he sent him and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Two lessons can be learned from this. People around you may question whether you're worthy for what God is calling you to do. He said, yet, are these all the children? There remains yet the youngest. He kind of, I mean, he obviously loved his son, but he didn't look at his son as worthy enough to be king of Israel. He hid him away. Sometimes there are going to be people that are going to question and probably push you off to the side because they don't think you're worthy of what God's calling you to do. But if God has called you to do it, you're going to do it. Second thing you can learn from it is people can try to hold you back from completing God's tasks. He's, by holding David back from Samuel, he was keeping that away from what was clearly God's will for Israel was for, um, was for David to be the king. He held him back from equipping what, uh, from what God had called and blessed him to do. And then the next lesson I want to kind of go over is the prodigal son. Now, let's kind of flip over that. I didn't put a tab in there. I've got one of these preacher's Bibles, uh, and it's got like three tabs. I needed four, but I've only got three. Um, so Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15, verse 18. Um, yeah, when I got one of these preacher's Bibles, it really wasn't even the fact that it was like a, a three tabs. If any of you have ever seen a goat skin Bible, I tell you, this is the craziest thing. I didn't know they can make a, a Bible out of a goat. Like, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting concept, but it feels like when I first held this thing, I said, I feel like heaven came down and glory filled my soul. But that was more of what I wanted it for. But uh, it came with three tabs. It's kind of a, an extra. It was a perk. Um, but uh, the prodigal son of the story, verses 18 and 19. It says, now let's just give context before I read that. We all know the story of the prodigal son. His father was rich. He wanted his uh, father's inheritance. So his father gives it to him. He goes off. He squanders his living. And I don't know how long it took him, but let's just say he quickly came back to his father. Now verse 18, it says, I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. We see this story, and he, he gets, the prodigal son gets into this place where he's so desperate. Now, I've written a sermon out of uh, this passage before, and one point I like to, to like to say when I go over it is, if you see in verse um, 16, and he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. This isn't particularly on the rad radar of, of God's calling, but I didn't want to say this because I feel impressed to say this. Don't let yourself get so indulged in sin that you've got to be so desperate to eat pig slop to listen to God. Think about that and hold that. I just felt impressed to say that. I don't know why, but there we go. Uh, I'm going to roll with it. But back to the story. He, he goes off. He indulges in his sin. He realized the penalty of living unrighteous and uh, living defiant of God. Uh, he returns to his father, and he expected to come home as a servant. He didn't feel worthy of his father's uh, house or father's wealth or being even just a part of his father's family. Uh, he then felt the overwhelming forgiveness of a father. Not just an uh, earthly father, but a heavenly father. And it's, it's a great example of what salvation is like. We go off, we uh, live in sin, we come back, we don't feel worthy, and yet God forgives. We may not feel worthy of God's calling. We may look at ourselves and say, I am not worthy to be called thy father's son. Make me as one of thy hired workers. Um, but God will equip us and prepare us and get us ready for battle. We're foot soldiers of the cross. We may feel unworthy. We may feel held back. We may feel like we're not really the perfect picture of what God has for a pastor, as I said at the beginning of the message. But it's important, like I've said probably three or four times now, if God calls you, he'll equip you. It's important to understand that. 
whatever God's calling may be, whether that is, like I said, a nursery to change a diaper, or as a uh, children's worker to deal with children or youth to help youth through their crazy, crazy, crazy drama. Boys, girls, oh my gosh, Susie did this. I can't believe it. That's, that's the day-to-day -day life with little Madison over. I love you, Madison. But, um, or if it's to be an elder or deacon, but that's, that's the pastor's choice, of course. It um, depends on churches. Some churches make you vote on deacons. Uh, but pastors, you know, God may call you to be a leader in your church as an elder or a deacon. If God calls you, God's going to impress that upon his heart but he's going to prepare you to have a compassionate heart because in the Bible, and, and I think it's 1 Timothy, when it talks about a deacon, the real role of a deacon is to care for the needs of people. I think the Greek word actually says uh, serve tables. If you think about a waiter or a waitress, your role is serving tables. You go and you do whatever you can. If they need a fork, you get them a fork. If you need a spoon, you get them a spoon. If they need food or salt or pepper or whatever, you get it for them. Reminds me of a story. I went to Olive Garden one time, and uh, it was one of my friend's birthdays. So I'm actually going to go down to Charleston and uh, see her in the next couple of days. Um, we went for, to Olive Garden for her birthday, and uh, I don't like Italian food. But by the looks of me, I don't like a whole lot. I'm pretty skinny. But, um, well, I went there anyway, and I had the kids' meal because, you know, I don't like Italian food. And I don't take much to eat. I ate there cheap. It was seven bucks. It was good. Um, but... I remember my, my buddy Eli, he was, um, he had some soup or something. And I, God bless this waitress. I don't know if she was just dumb or if she was just tired. But he says, she gets the soup to the table, gives him like a fork. And he says, ma'am, can I have a fork, please? Or excuse me, a spoon. Comes back with another fork. And I was like, it took me everything in my body. I said something to her. It wasn't very nice. God forgive me for it. But I'm going to be transparent. I didn't say very nice things to her. But, you know, sometimes serving tables, it can be exhausting like that, where you might, you know, end up giving them a fork and making a couple mistakes. But, you know, if God calls you to be a deacon, he'll prepare you to serve tables. He'll get you ready. Well, let's see, what other facets of ministry you could have as a missionary? If, some, if God's calling you to be a missionary, he may equip you to deal with harsh weather, you know, whatever it may be. But those are the lessons that God kind of taught me about it. And just to go over it before y'all got lost in my endless talking because I go on rabbit trails. I'd call myself the rabbit trail preacher. But just to brush over these, uh, these points, a calling consists of an unbelievable test, an unfathomable task, and an unworthy thought. My kind of exhortation to y'all, go out, find out what God's calling you to do, and get fighting. All right. Well, the one thing I, in listening to Micah speak and preach this morning, he, he mentioned a lot of things, and his, uh, kinder, I think it was his kindergarten principal or somebody at Jeff Davis uh, Pre-K, said, Micah has discovered his voice this year, and he speaks his mind. So uh, if you didn't know that by now, yeah, uh, Micah speaks his mind. But uh, what, what was that thing? That... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Y'all pray for me. Uh, <laughs> but what, what was the thing that you said about the, the prodigal son? And uh, it, was, it was that really serious moment. Uh, it was that verse. Six lot. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the paws that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. A lesson that I learned from, from that, and, and God had impressed this on my heart, was that sometimes because we're so stubborn, because I'm expecting, I'm thinking, you know, he, it says he was willing to get a job. So he was obviously at this point where he didn't want to go back to his father's house for pride's sakes. He was so stubborn, and he got himself to a point where he was so desperate to eat, it says he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pause that the swine were eating. And so what, what I was kind of saying a minute ago was that some of us, because we're so stubborn, get to a point where that we're so desperate that we, we're, we won't listen to God. And we get to the point where we're so desperate to eat pig slop. Just don't get yourself to that point. That's kind of what I was saying. Uh, I'm going to expound on that. Mike, if you go ahead and go to the piano. Um, 
When God called me into ministry, I, I knew as a child. And uh, my uncle told me at age eight, you know, well, I, he was, I was eight, he was not. Uh, but I, he said, Matthew, why be a preacher? Doctors make more money. I thought, oh, I like money. Let's be a doctor. But God kept dealing with me, and I, I fought it for years. And right before I surrendered to the call to ministry, I, w I was pretty much saying, God, I don't care. I don't care about the slop. I'd rather be in disobedience. I'd rather do my own thing. I don't want to do this. I don't want to deal with any consequences that could come from following God. I, I, some, of the, some of the people that I knew who were Christians acted the most miserable. I didn't want to be like them. I, I, was, I was in outright rebellion. So when Micah said that, I thought, that could be somebody in this room today. I don't know. Or maybe somebody watching on Facebook. And if that's you, you know what God wants you to do. Maybe it's to serve here in the church. Maybe to serve in the community. You know exactly what God wants you to do. And you say, I'm just not going to do it. I know this from experience. You will be miserable until you say, yes, Lord. My, my uh, year as a 16-year-old was miserable. And, and this is what I did as a 16-year-old. I, I got up in the morning. I went to school. I came home and took about a two-hour nap. Got up long enough to eat, do my homework, and went right back to bed because I was fighting the call of God. And I, I had no joy until May 4th of 1997 when I told my mom in our living room that I was going to follow the Lord and obey Him. And that's when I found joy. That's when I found peace in, in doing the will of God. So, I'm not going to make this long, but I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads for a moment. If, 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 there's, if there's something you need to do, if you need to come pray, maybe you need to be saved today, maybe you just need to say, yes, Lord. I've been saying no, Lord, for way too long. Today I need to say yes. Mike is going to sing a verse or so of I Surrender All. And um, if you need to respond to him, please do so. It's been good to be here this morning and uh, to join in with Micah and uh, to see all of you this morning. Uh, I say it over and over again like a broken record, but this is my favorite day of the week to be here with you all. Uh, looking forward to uh, next Sunday and all that God has in store. Don't forget, dads, we've got a gift for you out in the foyer, so be sure to grab that on your way out. Um, with that said... Travis, would you mind closing us out in prayer? <laughs>